Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's conversation on the state of international cooperation and uh, multilateralism. I am Brahima Kulibali, the Vice President of the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. And it's uh, a privilege, really, and a great honor uh, to welcome the US representative to the United Nations, Ambassador uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, she is the 31st US ambassador to the UN. She was nominated by President Biden in uh, January of last year and confirmed the following month by the Senate with overwhelming bipartisan support and sworn in on February 24th of last year. Uh, ambassador Thomas Greenfield is one of the most distinguished and experienced US diplomats with over 35 years uh, in the Foreign Service. But prior to the United Nations, she held senior positions at the Department of State, including serving as Assistant Secretary of uh, African Affairs from 2013 to 2017. And uh, her distinguished Foreign Service career includes ambassadorship to Liberia and postings in uh, Switzerland, Pakistan, Kenya, Gambia, Nigeria, and Jamaica. And after retiring from the State Department, she led the Africa practice at the Albright Stone Bridge Group and was Distinguished Fellow in African Studies at the Institute for the Diplomacy at Georgetown University. Uh, she is a recipient of several awards, including the Hubbard Humphrey Public Leadership Award, uh, the Bishop John T. Walker Distinguished Humanitarian Service Award, and the Warren Christopher Award for Outstanding Achievement in Global Affairs. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield uh, is often referred to as the People's Ambassador and is renowned for her trademark uh, gumbo diplomacy in reference to her ability to break down barriers and connect with her counterparts at a human level first by inviting them over to cook together and taste her great Louisiana cuisine. Uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, thank you for joining us. We know that you have an extremely busy uh, agenda, particularly with the crisis in uh, Ukraine. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me uh, the opportunity uh, here. Brookings does uh, extraordinary uh, work on uh, global economic development issues, and mm -hmm. I have engaged with you in the past, and I'm delighted to be uh, part of this discussion today. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Before we start, uh, I'd like to take a moment to have to pay our respect to one of your predecessors at the United Nations and the first woman Secretary of State, uh, Ambassador Madeleine Albright. Uh, uh, she was also a partner of yours at the Albright Stone Bridge Group. And if my memory uh, serves me correctly, the last time uh, I saw her was when I uh, came to see you at your office uh, before the pandemic. Um, uh, she was certainly a courageous trailblazer, uh, a champion of democracy and human rights, and a strong believer, I would say, in multilateralism and international cooperation. And as you have correctly pointed out, uh, she has certainly left a permanent mark on the United Nations and on the world, and uh, her legacy will, without a doubt, endure. Her legacy is, is seen every day in the United Nations. On the day she passed, mm -hmm. uh, we were considering a resolution on, on Ukraine, and every single ambassador, friends and foe, got up and commented about her extraordinary career and the impact she'd had on, on their lives. It was really a, a great moment uh, mm -hmm. for us uh, to hear uh, her hear about her legacy, although it was extraordinarily sad uh, mm -hmm. that she was no longer with us. Yeah, and uh, the world will certainly remain a much better place for, uh, for because of her service. Uh, so my, my last, you mentioned Ukraine, so perhaps we can, we can start uh, there with the Ukraine crisis. And, and uh, what you might see as some of the implications for the future of international cooperation. I think the war in Ukraine is being viewed perhaps as the closest we may have come to a global conflict since World War II. And many view it as a turning point that could mark the beginning of a new world order. 
so first, uh, how is the approach to the resolution of the war in Ukraine playing out at the UN? Uh, what guides how countries are casting their votes for or against uh, uh, Russia? Uh, and, and even those who are abstaining. And then second, you know, what do you see as the main implication for the world order? Is this divide telling us anything about uh, the configuration of an eventual new world order? Let me start by saying uh, first and foremost that the United States worked diligently prior to the start of this conflict to help find a diplomatic solution to avoid this unconscionable war that the Russians have uh, uh, taken uh, against the Ukrainian people. Uh, those efforts uh, included uh, President Biden reaching out directly to uh, President Putin, meeting with him directly in, in the months and weeks ahead of this. Uh, there were several meetings and discussions between Secretary Blinken and uh, his counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. We had discussions here in the, in the United Nations uh, to avoid what we are experiencing uh, right now. Uh, those efforts failed, and what Russia has succeeded in doing, they failed in bringing uh, down Ukraine, but they've succeeded in uniting uh, the, uh, the international community. Mm -hmm. They have succeeded in, in unifying and emboldening and, and giving courage to the Ukrainian people uh, to, uh, to fight back. Uh, and uh, they have succeeded in uniting uh, uh, NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, and the international community has uh, stood strongly in isolating Russia here uh, at the United Nations. We've had uh, two votes, uh, in fact, three votes in the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, one condemning Russia, in which we got 141 members mm -hmm. uh, to support. The second uh, calling for humanitarian assistance for the Ukrainian people. We got 140 votes for, for that. And just recently, last week, we succeeded in suspending Russia from the Human Rights Council uh, mm -hmm. through the uh, General Assembly. So they are isolated. Uh, here at the uh, United Nations. And mm -hmm. while they do have a veto, mm -hmm. their veto has not been uh, effective in vetoing our voices, in vetoing the condemnation, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, vetoing uh, the, the unity of, mm -hmm. uh, of the international community and calling, uh, calling Russia out. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there are some countries who abstain. I can't explain the reasoning behind uh, uh, other countries' decisions about uh, their votes. We've heard different uh, 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 explanations being given to us. Countries think that abstaining is neutrality. It's not neutrality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know that Russia has, has uh, started an unconscionable uh, uh, war. Uh, mm -hmm. They have committed um, uh, war crimes. They have committed human rights violations. Mm -hmm. You can't be neutral uh, mm -hmm. in the face of, of those kinds of uh, events. We know other countries have been threatened by the Russians, mm -hmm. uh, that if uh, countries voted against them or abstained, they would um, uh, take actions against those countries. Uh, mm -hmm. economically and at the United Nations. So countries made the decision, unfortunately, to abstain in the face of, uh, of intimidation. Uh, mm -hmm. But all said, we ha have been successful in isolating Russia here at the United Nations. And they've heard uh, clearly, they've heard loudly from the international community that we condemn their unconscionable war against the Ukrainian people. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, Madam. And uh, I think your your leadership in the efforts to suspend Russia indeed from the Human Rights Council uh, did, not go, did not go unnoticed. Uh, but it hasn't nonetheless stopped Russia. And the question might be, what else is there in the United Nations toolkit uh, to be able to pressure Russia and uh, cause them to reverse course, uh, especially that they, are, uh, they have veto powers in the Security Council? And is the UN running out of options at this point? Uh, we, the UN and the multilateral system is still the best tool that we have mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, to put pressure on, on the Russians. And we have not run out of options. Mm -hmm. We continue to ramp up our, our efforts. We continue to build our, our coalition of the willing against, uh, against the Russians. The United States has uh, increased our sanctions against the Russians. Mm -hmm. We have continued to put pressure on the Russians mm -hmm. and we have built a strong coalition of support uh, for the Ukrainians here at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, the Russians are, are feeling isolated. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not attending meetings at, at uh, high levels. Uh, they're using uh, disinformation that is not uh, believed uh, mm -hmm. in the United Nations. They still continue uh, to call this a military, uh, a, a temporary military action. And we've seen mm -hmm. what their military action can lead to, it can lead to the destruction of, mm -hmm. a, of a country. Mm -hmm. We're also raising the voices of Ukrainians. I traveled uh, to Moldova and Romania uh, two mm -hmm. weeks ago and had the opportunity to sit uh, with uh, uh, refugees who had fled the, uh, the carnage in mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine to hear uh, their their sense of terror, their their uh, worry about their family members, uh, and those voices will continue to be raised. Mm -hmm. And then, secondly, I had the opportunity to see what the United Nations is doing on the ground uh, mm -hmm. to support uh, those people who have been impacted by this war, both those who have crossed the border into neighboring countries, but mm -hmm. the more than six million who are still living inside of Ukraine who've mm -hmm. been forced from their homes. More than 10 million people have been forced totally. 4.3 million have crossed the borders into neighboring countries. And we're working with those neighbors, working mm -hmm. with the United Nations uh, systems, the humanitarian organizations to provide support uh, mm -hmm. to Ukrainians who are in need of that support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And I think you mentioned this, uh, uh, you know, solidarity. And I think it's really been impressive how uh, the world came together, uh, not just governments, but also uh, civil society and even the private sector doing everything they can to, uh, to uh, um, deter Russia. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there are questions around the commitment of some countries to democracy and to the rule-based order when they vote against <laughs> what was uh, supposed to help uh, a reverse course. We will certainly continue to see how this uh, unfolds. But if I can now take a step back from the uh, crisis in Ukraine and uh, discuss the state of uh, US relations with traditional partners at the UN, uh, I, I believe that the previous administration had turned its back to some extent on multilateralism and uh, deprioritized international cooperation. Um, I think this reversal confused many of our uh, traditional partners who support I think you would agree is essential for US leadership. But uh, the good news is the Biden administration began to reverse course from the first day in office. And for your part, you've also been proactive in repairing US relations at the UN. So how would you judge the current state of those relations? And to paraphrase President Biden, is America back at the UN? Uh, well, certainly, uh, given the fact that I am uh, running on a treadmill 24-7, uh, uh, we are back. And I will tell you that uh, when I uh, arrived in, in New York on the 25th of, of February, just uh, a few hours after I was confirmed uh, for this position, uh, mm -hmm. I really did hit the ground sprinting, as I described in my first remarks, uh, because within uh, uh, two days of, uh, no, four days of arriving here, I became president of the Security Council on March 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think there were, were some doubts uh, mm -hmm. about whether we were truly back. We rolled up our sleeves. We, mm -hmm. we really got to work in terms of rebuilding our relationships, rebuilding our alliances, re-engaging uh, in the multilateral uh, system. You know that we immediately um, uh, uh, noted that we were rejoining uh, the WHO. Right. We announced rejoining of the Human Rights uh, mm -hmm. Commission. Uh, mm -hmm. We started uh, to work on, on uh, the uh, rejoining uh, the, the Paris uh, Agreement. Agreement. So right. we really did uh, uh, move forward almost like uh, a bulldozer uh, okay. to get back into the multilateral system. So there's no doubt now mm -hmm. uh, that we're back. 
Mm -hmm. uh, our leadership has been uh, asserted in all of uh, these forums. Mm -hmm. uh, we have taken the leadership reign in, for example, addressing, addressing uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have delivered, the president um, uh, uh, noted that we can't address this pandemic alone. Uh, mm -hmm. by just dealing with uh, the consequences in our own country. We have mm -hmm. to address this in a global way, and we've led the global uh, pandemic response. Mm -hmm. We've delivered at this point more than 500 million uh, doses of uh, COVID vaccine. I have uh, made sure wherever I travel uh, mm -hmm. that I uh, highlight uh, uh, those efforts, including receiving and delivering doses, watching doses be uh, administered to health, uh, frontline healthcare workers, watching doses being delivered to uh, to ordinary uh, uh, people. So mm -hmm. we we've really reinvigorated our uh, our long term uh, alliances and our partnerships, and we've created new opportunities for uh, uh, for cooperation. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been on the road traveling. Uh, I, I since in the little over one year that I've been here, I've traveled to Ecuador, to mm -hmm. Haiti, uh, to Thailand, to Japan, mm -hmm. uh, to Niger, and and uh, Mali, uh, Gabon, mm -hmm. uh, and it goes on and on. I mentioned Moldova and Romania just uh, this past week, mm -hmm. and all of that is part of our our effort to uh, again reengage. Mm -hmm. uh, I have tried over the course of one year to meet with every permanent representative here right. in New York. I've mm -hmm. hit 117 uh, as of uh, today, uh, and I'm disappointed because my plan had been to meet with all 193 mm -hmm. uh, in my first year. I mm -hmm. realized that I can't be in two places as, at once, as I noted to you. I, I, I'm being missed right now at the Security Council as a meeting on Ethiopia is, is being uh, discussed. But I do try to be in two places at one time because I know how important our presence uh, is on the multilateral stage and how strong our voice is when, uh, when, we, when we speak in, in multilateral forums. Mm -hmm. Yes, and most definitely when you were taking office, nobody could have predicted the Ukraine crisis. So. Uh, priorities come uh, insert themselves within priorities. So I yes. think achieving 117 is very impressive in this context. Um, but in terms of then the US leadership, I think uh, you would agree that it's about uh, traditional partners, but also about non-traditional partners. And if the US is gonna lead effectively on the global stage, then uh, how do we engage with the non-traditional partners, um, especially the ones that are influential in, in their own rights on the global stage. Uh, and among the non-traditional partners, none is perhaps more influential than China. And some observers uh, are concerned that uh, we could end up in a bipolar world order with US and China leading two distinct blocks, uh, similar to the Cold War era. Uh, so competition is uh, inevitable, but cooperation is also necessary to address some global challenges. So how are you navigating this complex relationship with China and where do you differ the most with your Chinese counterpart? You know, um, our relationship with China is, is probably the most complex, uh, the most complicated and the most con consequential uh, relationship that uh, we have uh, here in uh, in mm -hmm. New York, but also around the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, and the president has has been clear that uh, we're going to compete with China, and mm -hmm. we uh, but we have a profound stake in ensuring that the values and the institutions that the United States uh, believes in, the institutions that we hope to create. Uh, and that we've invested in uh, continue to deliver. So we're not always as clearly not always in sync uh, with, the, with the Chinese as, as we approach them here on the international stage, but they are uh, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. So we deal with them on a daily basis. Uh, I deal with them uh, consistently as a member of, uh, of the P5 
Uh, and as members of the P5, including Russia, we have a responsibility to hold, uh, uphold the foundational principles of the United Nations, of the, of the Charter, and to encourage others to do the same. And this is why we have been so strong mm -hmm. in pushing against Russia, a P5 member with responsibilities mm -hmm. uh, who has uh, broken uh, its, its, um, its commitment uh, to the United Nations by invading another country. So we've put pressure on China to join us in condemning uh, the, uh, the Russians. We put pressure on China uh, to joining us in holding the DPRK accountable uh, for uh, the uh, recent, uh, the, the test of, uh, of ICBMs that they have done over the course of, of the past few uh, mm -hmm. a few months. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've put pressure on, on China to work with us in areas where we do uh, have uh, commonality, uh, to work with us on delivering a humanitarian assistance, to work with us on climate change. But mm -hmm. that said, we continue to hold them accountable for their own human rights violations. Mm -hmm. We don't uh, shy away from uh, raising those concerns. And we've made clear that what we see happening in Xinjiang uh, related to the Uyghurs is, mm -hmm. is, is, um, is uh, a crime against humanity, it's genocide. We, mm -hmm. We've called it out for what it is and we're committed uh, to, uh, and the administration is committed to consistently calling the Chinese out on, on this issue. Uh, mm -hmm. They clearly don't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they've made the unfortunate decision of aligning uh, themselves uh, with the Russians on Ukraine, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's a comfortable place for them because they have indicated that they do believe in the charter. They mm -hmm. do believe in the sovereignty of, uh, of, uh, of a nation. They do believe in the integrity of borders. And if mm -hmm. they believe in those three things, the charter, mm -hmm. sovereignty, and integrity of borders, they cannot uh, be comfortable supporting uh, Russia's unconscionable uh, attack on the Ukrainian people. Yeah, no, that's a very uh, powerful and compelling, compelling point. Um, then, then uh, speaking on the, of how the UN itself functions here, if we can switch a bit to uh, the US, the UN reform agenda. Uh, so I think there's uh, broad agreement that since the UN was created after World War II, it has served a very useful function um, However, it's increasingly evident too that it could use some more reforms uh, to respond more effectively to the challenges uh, <clears throat> of the 21st century. I think you echoed uh, some of these sentiments during your confirmation hearing uh, when you stated that we must have the courage to insist on the reforms uh, that make the UN more efficient and effective. So having uh, now uh, observed uh, uh, how the UN operates from within over the past uh, year or so. What do you see as the highest uh, priority areas for reforming the UN system that can make it more efficient and effective? You know, um, this is a complicated uh, bureaucracy. It's a huge uh, bu bureaucracy that's not just uh, how we operate in the Security Council and the General Assembly, but you have all the specialized agencies that are operating uh, out there as well. And our approach to the UN has been very deliberate. It's been strategic. Uh, we've tried to be uh, inclusive in terms of extending uh, the UN system to those uh, countries and people who have been historically marginalized and uh, to uh, include uh, racial and ethnic and religious minorities persons with disabilities, those marginalized due, due to sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, we lead in the UN and we push reforms in the UN that recognize the basic rights of people. Mm -hmm. And this is not about just member state rights, mm -hmm. but it's about uh, the rights of people. So we've worked uh, to push you, uh, reforms in terms of advancing gender equality and the full and meaningful mm -hmm. participation of women within the UN system. Uh, we're working to tackle some of the global challenges 
uh, that require member states to, to actually uh, be part of the UN system. And then, as you know, there's a whole uh, slew of reform efforts uh, that are out there, including one most recently that we, we support uh, that has been led by uh, Lichtenstein that requires, mm -hmm. will require if this resolution passed that uh, the permanent members of the Security Council uh, come to the General, Assemb uh, General Assembly and explain why they use their veto. And we support okay. that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're working, more, more accountability, basically. Yes. Yeah. So we're working, we're, we're ready to explain when we use our veto and we want others uh, to explain uh, when they use their veto as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to, within the UN system, you know, ensure the integrity and effectiveness of the, of the UN itself. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working to stamp out sexual uh, abuse, exploitation, uh, we're pushing the UN to become more efficient, uh, and we're working with other countries to, uh, to support their, those efforts as well. Uh, there's lots of discussion when you talk about UN reform, of mm -hmm. Security Council reform as well, yeah. and right. what that will mean in terms of, uh, of, uh, of adding new uh, elected members, mm -hmm. as well as adding new permanent uh, members of the Security Council, and we've been clear mm -hmm. that we are prepared to uh, engage in, in those discussions and see mm -hmm. uh, and, and absolutely see where uh, where they lead us. Yeah, and here at, at Brooking, we, we know we've been obviously doing some work looking at this and and brought together uh, scholars from Global North and Global South to collectively brainstorm about how the UN system can be reformed and what a reformed UN system could look like. And mm -hmm. we have some ideas and proposal we've uh, uh, put into a collection of essays that's well, available. I'd, lo I'd love to see those. Please, please share them with me. Yes, most definitely. Uh, well, and, and sticking with the reform, I think the Secretary General has also had mentioned the upcoming summit of the future uh, to agree on com a common agenda and a package of reforms to the international system. But we know that previous efforts or attempts to reform the UN system have faced significant uh, obstacles. Uh, what can we expect from the upcoming uh, summit? But I have to say that this was announced, that was before the Russia, Ukraine, maybe the yeah. dynamics have now changed. But are you optimistic that if it does go through with the reform plan for next year, that this time could be different and we could see a more meaningful reform of the institution, including, as you flagged, the UN Security Council itself. You know, we uh, stand ready to partner with uh, with the Secretary General and broadly with the United Nations and and member states and civil society and other stakeholders as, uh, on many of the elements of the Secretary General's common uh, agenda uh, report, and particularly in areas of climate change, on human rights, on public health, on sustainable development goals, and on UN reform. Uh, so I think this is still a work in progress, uh, and, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, where, where it leads. But uh, just to, to be clear, it's something that we will uh, partner with the uh, United Nations on, partner with the Secretary General to, uh, to work on making this organization that we all contribute mm -hmm. to, contributed to building, mm -hmm. uh, to make it uh, more efficient, to make it more effective, to mm -hmm. make it uh, deliver on what people expect it to deliver on. And that, uh, and, and particularly as it relates to the Security Council, uh, that our job is to save the world from, uh, from the scourge of war. Uh, we're, we're, we should be promoting peace and security. Uh, right. and, uh, and we have to make sure that that is front and center of what we do and what the Secretary General uh, does in, as in, in his efforts to, uh, to push forward his, his own agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. And here at Brookings too, we're really predisposed to, uh, to share uh, with uh, all parties uh, involved in the reform process. Uh, the, uh, uh, the results from our research. Uh, and I think too, we mentioned the UN uh, specifically, but I think, uh, um, I believe other multilateral institutions, uh, the IMF, World Bank, WTO, could all uh, use some reforms to be better fit uh, to address the challenges of the uh, 21st century. But certainly the UN uh, showing the way can certainly inspire uh, the other institution uh, to undertake those meaningful reforms. 
Um, if I can uh, now uh, talk about the sustainable development goals, uh, which you know it's been now seven years uh, since the countries around the world have come together to establish uh, those UN Sustainable Development Goals. I think it was in, it was in 2015 with a target date of 2030. Um, progress has been slow in many countries are considered to be off track. And COVID has likely even set some countries back. Uh, and the Ukraine crisis, I suspect, is not going to help either. So as we approach this midpoint of the target, how do you assess uh, the progress on those SDG agenda globally, uh, but also in the US? Because it's not just about developing countries. I think uh, SDGs are very much relevant for the US. And what additional efforts and steps do you think are needed to accelerate the progress? You know, it's, um, um, uh, I mean, we've made clear uh, from the start that we're committed uh, to accelerating the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development mm -hmm. and achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you know, I, and, and there's some that are, are a higher priority for us than, than others. I, I'll start with SDG4, where mm -hmm. uh, it uh, focuses on, on quality uh, education. Um, 10 U.S. agencies, including uh, USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, partner mm -hmm. globally with, um, uh, with countries to improve education systems at all levels. We've provided over a billion to support uh, governments and civil society, but the COVID uh, crisis set us back significantly yeah. on, right. on that goal. Suddenly, mm -hmm. it's not just about providing uh, books and teachers, it's providing technology, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, was clearly something we sh should have been doing, but we had to speed up, uh, you know, providing the technology so kids could learn from home. It was easier here to do it in the United States and in the developed world than to do it in, uh, uh, in the developing world. Mm -hmm. So the developing world has fallen behind mm -hmm. uh, significantly mm -hmm. uh, on, on this development goal because of, uh, because of uh, the, the pandemic. And I think we're going to see that they're falling behind on other goals as well. Mm -hmm. SDG 5, Advancing Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, uh, mm -hmm. Our view on that is simple. Uh, women's political participation promotes strong democracy. It's, mm -hmm. It supports peace. I, I talked about that today. Uh, I was in the council uh, on a Yemen discussion and talked about the importance of having Yemeni women engaged in, in the, uh, in the uh, peace talks and in the newly formed government. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we see that even in Ukraine where the the vast majority of the refugees that we see flowing across the border uh, from Ukraine are women. Uh, so women have to play uh, a significant uh, role. And of course, across Africa, we see the importance uh, that women have uh, played in, in peace and, and security. Uh, mm -hmm. And I always uh, take the opportunity when uh, we're talking about women's engagement in peace and security to commend uh, President uh, Johnson Sirleaf and the efforts that she made in Liberia uh, mm -hmm. to bring about peace and security after that country had gone through more than 14 years of a uh, of a civil war, mm -hmm. uh, climate change. We have to address the protection of, of our natural uh, resources, our ecosystems. That's mm -hmm. a top priority for, uh, for the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we strongly supported the UN Environment Assembly's launch of negotiations for a global agreement uh, mm -hmm. to combat uh, ocean plastic pollution that happened just recently. And closer mm -hmm. to home, we've endorsed the goal of conserving at least 30% of land and water by, uh, by 2030. So mm -hmm. we're making uh, progress uh, for sure as, uh, as are others on trying to address uh, these goals, but we have to be realistic that the contingencies of today's crises set mm -hmm. us back every single right. time. None of us could have projected uh, yeah. Ukraine. Uh, mm -hmm. None of us could have projected uh, the pandemic. Uh, and uh, we're beginning to see more and more uh, the impact of climate change uh, increasing, uh, increasingly having an impact on our ability to actually uh, achieve these goals in the time frame that we have. But we've not, uh, we've not um, um, pushed them back. We've not deprioritized them. We're mm -hmm. committed to accelerating uh, the achievements of the SDGs. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and, and certainly, you know, stronger US leadership and voice on the issue would be really important uh, in pushing the agenda here forward. And uh, here at Brookings, we do quite a lot of work, including with the leadership of the UN, also on those sustainable development uh, goals, and even have launched a center in late uh, uh, 2020, uh, which kind of really signaled our own institutional commitment uh, to uh, this agenda, including on the US leadership on the, on the agenda as well. Uh, so it certainly be a better place in 2030 if uh, uh, all countries are able to declare victory in terms of reaching uh, their, their targets. Um, so I have um, one more question and then we can uh, um, turn to uh, some uh, Q&A audience questions. Uh, so I think when it, this is about your priorities um, and when you took office uh, versus all, and also what the priorities are going forward. Um, I think when you took office, the world was, and it still is really facing uh, significant uh, challenges uh, ranging from a looming climate crisis, a global pandemic, a recession, and a string of conflicts and humanitarian crisis, that's Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, among others. But in the face of these uh, numerous uh, challenges and new ones that actually spring up too, how do you prioritize? Uh, I think I heard you, uh, you used a, a phrase, the priorities within the priorities. <laughs> yes. and, and that's uh, uh, really basically what we, we've had to do. And I used to hear President Surley talk about the priorities of the priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't always get to define what your priorities are. Mm -hmm. But if I could define a priority, it is always to be ready and flexible Mm -hmm. uh, to address whatever priority uh, yeah. we have in front of us. And to do that, you have to do what we've done over the course of this year, uh, rebuild our alliances, mm -hmm. uh, 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 engage with everyone in the UN so that you understand their priorities mm -hmm. and they understand our priorities so that we're not calling on them uh, mm -hmm. the day we need them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we've developed those relationships. We've done the gumbo diplomacy that is needed to mm -hmm. engage with people so that when we need their support, they, they're there for us. And when they need our support, mm -hmm. uh, we are, are there uh, for them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, among many uh, of the priorities here for us, uh, we lead with our values and human rights are core. Uh, we cannot ever ignore the importance of human rights in every single one of these crises that mm -hmm. we have engaged in over the course of the one year that I've been here, uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Ethiopia to Yemen, uh, to uh, Sudan, uh, to Libya, uh, you name it. It is, it's, it's about the impact on ordinary people. And mm -hmm. I try uh, to the extent that I can to engage with uh, with ordinary people, so that I can bring their voices uh, mm -hmm. to uh, 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 to the Security Council when I speak at the Security Council, and then um, uh, Brahima, the other uh, issue that I think is really important, and I think uh, you and others on the audience will appreciate that we have made it part of our priority to ensure that NGOs uh, mm -hmm. and civil society. Uh, have a voice uh, at the United Nations. So we push uh, regularly and constantly uh, for civil society uh, voices to, to speak. When we spoke yesterday about the issues of, uh, of, of um, uh, sexual violence uh, uh, against women, uh, we had uh, three extraordinary women uh, come before the council uh, to speak. Uh, two speaking from the uh, context of, of Syria and one from Ethiopia. And mm -hmm. those voices matter. It, it's, mm -hmm. They matter more than our voices matter. So that mm -hmm. is a, a priority for the U.S. as we deal with the myriad of, of, of crises, having mm -hmm. civil society uh, there, having human rights at the center of, of uh, our policy and mm -hmm. bringing uh, our partners and alliances uh, together together. Uh, to partner on, on issues of common uh, interest to, uh, to the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, no, thank you. And uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of what you just mentioned on 
the way the UN has been able to bring in civil society organizations uh, into the discourse. I think it's very crucial and it would be a, a great for that to remain a very important part of even the future of a multilateral system uh, as, we, as, we, as we envision it. Um, so uh, with that, I can uh, turn to some of the questions that uh, we've received. Um, and the, and the, the, the first one is from Sarah Griffin. She's through the UN uh, Population Fund. And her question is, uh, how do we ensure that the unique needs of women and girls, particularly protection from sexual violence, are prioritized in a humanitarian crisis? Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for that question. And uh, I will recommend that you uh, uh, go back uh, on UNNet uh, and, and listen at our discussion yesterday in the Security mm -hmm. Council, because every single member state indicated how important it is that we prioritize women and girls in every activity that the United Nations uh, is doing wherever they are in the world. And, uh, and that we hold countries uh, and we hold the UN uh, agencies and even the NGOs that we fund accountable for ensuring that they um, uh, focus on, on the needs of, of women and girls. Mm -hmm. uh, it is unconscionable today that we're still dealing with the issues of sexual exploitation of mm -hmm. uh, women and, and girls by um, uh, in uh, peacekeeping forces or even uh, uh, within uh, the humanitarian uh, uh, community. It is unconscionable that today we're still dealing with rape as a tool of war. Mm -hmm. uh, I shared with the, with the group that in the 1990s, I was uh, working with Somali refugees who had escaped Somalia and were in the refugee camps in, uh, in Dadaab. Uh, and Somali women were... Um, uh, we were dealing with issues of women who were victims of violence. And we had a whole program, women's victims of violence. And mm -hmm. how do we address rape as a tool of war in the 1990s? Uh, it didn't start then. Uh, it didn't, and it hasn't, uh, uh, it hasn't ended now because just yesterday we're talking about uh, Ukrainian women who have been uh, the victims of, of rape in this unconscionable war that the Russians are carrying out against the Ukrainian people. We heard um, an Ethiopian civil society uh, voice, an advocate talk about in Ethiopia, uh, women who were victims of rape uh, in, in that war. So it still continues today and, and we have to be prepared uh, to address it wherever we see it. And we have to call it out and we have to call out countries that countries um, partially out of embarrassment or whatever, they deny it, they mm -hmm. can't deny it. What they have to do is hold their people accountable uh, for engaging in, in these actions. And we have to hold countries accountable for holding their people accountable uh, mm -hmm. for these actions. And we have to give voice to the women who've been victims of uh, this issue. You can tell, uh, uh, Brahima, that this is an issue that is truly uh, uh, something that's important to me. We mm -hmm. have to give these women their voices uh, mm -hmm. and not let them be victimized twice by not allowing them uh, to hold their their uh, the perpetrators accountable. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, th th thank you for that. And uh, and th the next question is from Ala Alani, who's a director with uh, the, with Menazel. Said, why is U.S. condemning Russia and imposing strong sanctions uh, because of Ukraine while turning a blind eye on Israel, despite occupation of Palestinian land and the atrocities committed against Palestinians? Look, we we uh, condemn atrocities wherever they happen, but we also strongly support Israel's right to exist mm -hmm. and the unfair targeting of Israel within the United Nations and across the world. Uh, the uh, Biden administration has been clear that we support a two-state solution uh, and we have uh, uh, encouraged that here at the United Nations and in our conversations, both with Israel 
and with uh, with the uh, Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And since I've been here, I've traveled to Israel and I also traveled to the West Bank and I've met with both sides on, on this issue. And uh, clearly we need to find a solution that provides peace and security for the Israeli people, but also mm -hmm. safety and security for the Palestinian people within their own borders. So this mm -hmm. is something that uh, we have been clear on throughout. But again, uh, here at the United Nations, we have been absolutely categorically supportive of Israel's right to exist. And mm -hmm. uh, we have fought against the unfair targeting of Israel uh, within the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, uh, the, the final question uh, comes from Steve Brunt. He's uh, principal at Trim Tad Management System says, uh, based on President Zelensky declaring the world's peace organization is obsolete in his speech to the US Congress, do you support a design of a new peace process that eliminates the root cause of why we fight and offers a vision of a world beyond war to motivate that societal transformation? You know, uh, President Zelensky just didn't say that in front of the Congress. He said it to, uh, uh, to the Security Council when he spoke to the Security Council. And I certainly um, uh, appreciate and understand his frustration. Uh, his, his country is being attacked. People are being killed. Uh, cities are being demolished. Uh, hospitals with children are, are being attacked. And, and he asked the, a question that none of us could have uh, uh, denied him, and that is why has the UN not done more uh, mm -hmm. to, to stop this? Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, done, uh, from the start, we have made every effort to isolate the Russians, to put pressure on the Russians, and to help the Russians find a diplomatic solution to uh, have avoided this, this war. We have mm -hmm. supported Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian uh, government, uh, throughout this, both uh, in terms of uh, funding. I just heard as uh, was coming into this meeting that we had announced uh, another uh, nearly a billion dollars of support uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, but the United Nations has to uh, remain strong in calling out Russia and mm -hmm. uh, holding Russia accountable. Uh, it was not an easy task uh, suspending Russia from the Human Rights Council. So uh, the United Nations and, and the, the member states have, have uh, supported Ukraine and we will continue to support Ukraine and do everything possible to bring this uh, war uh, to uh, an end. Uh, we are supporting uh, the Ukrainian prosecutors' uh, efforts to uh, 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 get, gain evidence uh, to bring against uh, the Russians uh, for war crimes. Uh, and uh, we've called it uh, war crimes, and we will do everything possible uh, to hold the Russians uh, accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Amb Ambassador. And uh, we're getting close to the, the end of uh, our time, so we could uh, let you resume the, the busy agenda you have at the UN. Uh, uh, do you have any parting thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? You know, I. The, the United Nations uh, is the best uh, tool that we have multilaterally uh, to address issues of peace and security around the globe. It is not perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. Reforms are needed. Uh, changes need to be made. Uh, but we can still work as an institution uh, to hold countries accountable uh, to support those countries that are in need as we've done uh, with Ukraine and, and to support people, uh, the people around the world who look to the United Nations. And sometimes they're just looking to hear that we have not forgotten them. Uh, and that is something that uh, we do on a regular basis. So we're committed to helping this organization to improve, uh, to helping uh, to build build its capacity uh, to address peace and security issues uh, as they are presented to us on, uh, on a regular basis. And none of us can guess where the next crisis uh, right. will be. Uh, 
uh, we're dealing with the crisis of the of today and the crisis of yesterday. We don't know what the crisis of tomorrow will be, but we will uh, keep working to try to be prepared to address those crises as they are presented to us. So thank you so much uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. And uh, I look forward to continuing to uh, represent uh, uh, the interests of the United States, but also the interests uh, of the world uh, to find uh, peaceful solutions to uh, all these uh, crisis situations that we're dealing with today. Yeah, thank you so much. And we are also very uh, grateful uh, for your leadership and, uh, and service uh, to the country and to the world at this very critical moment. Uh, so thank you again, Ambassador. And I uh, really appreciate you even uh, taking time out of and skipping a UN Security Council meeting to be with us. Uh, uh, we will appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate you as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.